If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and attempt to solve the question on your own before listening on. To get this problem started, it might be helpful to take the pi over 2 and distribute it into the brackets. So we're going to be multiplying the pi over 2 by the 2 reciprocal meters and also by the 8 reciprocal seconds. Maybe we can show that work over here for clarity. So when we multiply the pi over 2 by 2, we should just get pi. And then when we multiply the pi over 2 by 8, we should end up with 4 pi. And the reason this is helpful is because then we have the equation in a sort of standard form of kx minus omega t. So by lining the equation up, we can see that the value of k is going to be pi, and then the value of omega will be equal to 4 pi. So for part a, we can calculate the frequency, which is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. And since we know the value of omega is 4 pi, we can just plug in. And when we simplify that, we can see that the frequency is two cycles per second. Or if we prefer, we could write that as two hertz. So that would be the correct answer to part A of the question. For part B, we know the wavelength is equal to two pi divided by k. So we can plug in the value of k that we determined earlier, which was pi. And when we simplify that, we can see that the wavelength is equal to two meters. So that would be the correct answer to part B. For part C, we know that the speed of the wave is the product of the wavelength and the frequency, so we could just plug in the values we just determined. And when we simplify that, we get 4 meters per second. So that would be the correct speed and answer to part C. Now to solve the remaining portion of the question, it turns out that we have to add together the two waves that are described by these equations. And so to do that, it might be a good idea to denote the first equation as y1 and the second equation as y2. Therefore, when we add them together, we'll have y1 plus y2. So let's go ahead and fill in the equation for y1 and then the equation for y2. Now, for simplicity, we've dropped the units of the values that are inside the brackets of both terms. Now, there might be several ways to proceed here. One way would be to first factor out a 6. We could also distribute the pi over 2 into the parentheses of both terms. Now, at this point, we're going to have to refer to a relatively obscure theorem that relates the sum of cosine functions to the product of those cosine functions. So here is that identity. You probably want to pause the video and just take a look at it, make sure it makes sense. And in order to use this identity, what we need to basically do is let this quantity be our alpha and this quantity here be our beta. And we can see that when we add cosine of alpha plus cosine of beta, it becomes this set of terms over here. So essentially, we're going to have to add together our alpha and beta and then divide them by 2, and also subtract our alpha and beta and divide them by 2. So let's try to do that with our current expression here. Now, we'll notice when we add our alpha to our beta, the pi x plus pi x will become 2 pi x. The 4 pi t and the minus 4 pi t will cancel. So we're going to be left with 2 pi x for the numerator, but then we see the identity asks us to divide by 2. So when we divide by 2, that's going to actually cancel this 2. So we're left with the cosine of pi x. Notice the 2 is present here because of the identity. Now, for the next term, we have to subtract our alpha and beta. So the pi x minus the pi x will cancel. The 4 pi t minus a negative 4 pi t will become positive 8 pi t. That'll be the numerator, but then we have to divide by 2. So we're going to have the cosine of 8 pi t, but again, because we're going to divide by 2, this will actually become 4 pi t. And then at this point, we can multiply the 6 by the 2 to make 12. And so this would be our final expression for y1 plus y2. Now, to solve part d, we need to note that nodes will occur when the cosine of pi x is equal to 0. And the solution to this equation is the quantity of pi x would have to equal an integer multiple of pi plus pi over 2. A little bit of trigonometry there. Basically, we might recall from trigonometry that the cosine function has a value of 0 at pi over 2, and then the next value, where it's 0, would be a multiple of pi. So if we added pi on to there, 
we would get the next value where the cosine is zero. If we added pi again, we would get the next value and so on. So the mathematical way of expressing that is to take pi over two and add an integer multiple of pi. We can solve this equation for x by dividing each term by pi. As far as units are concerned, we have to remember that when we divided by pi, the unit of that quantity was inverse meters. So essentially what that means is that when you divide by inverse meters, your unit comes out to actually just meters. So this quantity is in meters. Now we're looking for the smallest value at which there is a node. So that would occur when n is equal to zero. That's the smallest value that we could let n equal. And so when we plug zero in there, we can see that x would turn out to be half of a meter. So this would be the correct answer to part D of the question. The second smallest would be when n is equal to one. And when we plug that into the formula, we could see then that x would become 1.5 meters. And finally, the third smallest would be when n is equal to two. And then of course, x would turn out to be two and a half meters. So those would be the answers to parts D, E, and F. Now for an anti-node, it turns out that we want the cosine of pi x to achieve its maximum value. Now the maximum value of cosine of pi x would be plus or minus one. And the solution to this equation is when pi x is equal to a multiple of pi. Recall again from trigonometry that the cosine achieves a value of negative one at the value of pi and then it achieves a value of positive one at a value of two pi. And so that pattern would continue. Any integer multiple of pi would allow the cosine function to either be positive one or negative one. When we solve for x by dividing through by pi, we can see that x has to equal n. Again, the unit there will be meters because when we divided by pi, we divided by an inverse meter. And so for the smallest, we would let n equal zero. And if we plug that into this equation, we could see that the x value would equal zero meters. So that would be the correct answer to part G. When n is, we'll come over here, when n is equal to one, that would be the next smallest. So x would equal one meter. And finally, for the third smallest, n could be set equal to two, and that would allow x to equal two meters. And that's the correct answer to part I. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you'd like to, please click the thumbs up icon and subscribe to the channel so you could stay tuned for additional videos. You're welcome to send in your own question to the email address on the screen, and I'll do my best to post a solution to it on YouTube.